And the title of my sermon tonight is called Faith versus Freeloading. Faith versus Freeloading. There's, there's two concepts, there's one concept really that just needs to be um, looked at. And what we see here in Matthew chapter 6 is Jesus trying to explain where our focus ought to be in this life. What, what are the things that really matter? You know, this is, this is the famous chapter where he says, you know, not to lay up treasures for yourself on earth, but lay up treasures for yourself in heaven. This is the mindset that we ought to have as believers. This world is not our home. We're just passing through, right? This isn't where we're going to lay everything up and everything that we do is geared towards how much can we build and invest and do just for this world and in this life right here. Our goals, that what we're working for, how we're investing our time, for the most part, should all have the vision of the future, of heaven, of the things that, that we can lay up for ourselves, the rewards that we could receive, and where we will be and be spending eternity. That is what we ought to be mindful of. And this is what this chapter is generally teaching. I mean, this is what it says. Now, in order to do that... In order to spend our time doing these things, well, we know we have physical needs. There are needs that need to be met in this lifetime. And what Jesus is trying to do is to explain to them, look, if you're going to do what's right, if you're going to follow God's commandments, if you're going to obey God and do everything that God, the work that he's laid out for you, you don't have to worry about those things. God will make sure that you're taken care of. But the key to that is if you're going to be doing his work. And see, unfortunately, we have too many people that want to say, oh, I have this great faith that God's just going to take care of me no matter what. Just as in, I don't have to do anything, right? And and what happens is people get a lazy mentality of not end up doing anything and considering themselves that they have this great faith. Well, God's going to take care of me. Even though I'm not doing anything for him. And we're going we're gonna to look at this and we're going to get the biblical teaching on this subject. Like I said, it's a real simple subject. But it's a really important one. Amen. It's important to have faith that God will take care of you and protect you. Amen and amen. But it's also important not to be ignorant of what our responsibilities are to God. And the conditions under which he will take care of us. Because there are conditions. Right. It's always nice to, to, to come back and remember the relationship that we have as believers with our Father, our Heavenly Father. And we are His adopted children. If you had a son living under your house and under your roof, and he was of age to actually work and do stuff and provide, and you commanded him, Hey, son, you've got to do this. These are your chores. You've got to do this. You've got to do this. You've got to do this. And wouldn't do any of it. A lot of people, you know, I mean, what I would do, if they're, if they're of age, they're old enough to do it, to say, well, look, if you're not listening to me, you're not obeying my commandments, then get out of my house. Right? right. Doesn't mean you don't love them. Right. You're going to be teaching them a lesson that if you're going to be under my house, you're going to be under my rules. And you're going to do the work that I, that I have for you to do. You have to chip in or otherwise, you know, I'm not going to be taking care of you. Especially if father, you're taking care of the, the, you know, feeding them, clothing them, housing them, everything else. When they, uh, when they do that, then it's, then it's time to, to say, okay, we're going to be on your own. You're going to reap what you sow when you decide not to work. And ultimately, God's going to do the same thing for us. Look, it's not like you're going to go to hell. Obviously, we can't lose our salvation. But... There are things that we ought to do. Now, I'm getting a little bit ahead of myself. Look at verse 9 in Matthew 6, because this is where he teaches us how we ought to pray. Okay, what are the things that that, that we ought to pray? When we pray to God, what's the format? What types of things should we be including and thinking about and going to God with? Verse 9, After this manner, therefore, pray ye, Our Father which art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come. Thy will be done in earth as it is in heaven. Look at verse 11. Give us this day our daily bread. What is that stating there? It's a reliance on God every day for your food. What am I going to eat today? God, please give me my food every day. God, please provide for me. 
This is how our prayers should be to God, where we have a reliance on the Lord for, for our needs. God wants us to rely on Him. But He also wants us to work. Jump down to verse number 24. See, we don't want to we want to make sure we get the right principle that's being taught here, and that it's not just saying that you can just sit at home on the couch. Not lift a finger and just say, well, the Bible says that, you know, God, just give me my daily bread. God, just take care of me, feed me as a, 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 a slugger, gluttonous child and think that God's just going to continue to, to put grapes in your mouth or something. That's not the way God works. Look at verse number 24. No man can serve two masters. For either he will hate the one and love the other, or else he will hold to the one and despise the other. You cannot serve God and mammon. And that word mammon is referring to money. You can't be serving God and serving for money at the same time. He's saying you got to do one or the other, right? You're either interested in earning a bunch of riches in this world, or you're interested in serving God. Now, you, 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 know, you can only serve one at a time. You can't be serving them both simultaneously. It's not going to work. So what happens, well, here, let's just keep reading here. Therefore, I say unto you, he says, for this reason, for the reason that you can't serve God and mammon, take no thought for your life, what ye shall eat or what ye shall drink, nor yet for your body, what ye shall put on. Is not the life more than meat and the body than raiment? Behold the fowls of the air, for they sow not, neither do they reap, nor gather in the barns. Yet your heavenly Father feedeth them. Are ye not much better than they? So he's explaining, I don't want you to worry about these little things because you have bigger things to be focused on and, and doing. And he explains, look, the fowls of the air, the birds, they don't have to sow seed and, and, you know, and, and go through the whole harvest and reap them and everything else. He says they don't gather their food in the barns, but they're taken care of every day. Every day they have food. Right? Birds are able to get their food every single day. They're taken care of. And he's saying, aren't you much better than they? And by the way, yes, as human beings, we are much better than the beasts that God created on this earth. There is a difference between us and the beasts. Just because we're all his creation does not mean that it's the same importance level that God has put on us as on animals. Right. We are more important than the animals. And praise God for that. We're made after the image of God. Amen. But what he's pointing out here is, look, God's taking care of even these animals, even just the birds. God takes care of them. Don't you think that God will take care of you also? Which of you, by taking thought, can add one cubit unto his stature? And why take ye thought for raiment? Raiment is a clothing. Consider the lilies of the field, how they grow. They toil not, neither do they spin. And yet I say unto you that even Solomon in all his glory was not arrayed like one of these. Wherefore, if God so clothe the grass of the field, which today is and tomorrow is cast into the oven, shall he not much more clothe you, look at this, O ye of little faith. Jesus is trying to explain that you don't have to spend your entire life focused on making money so that you can eat and drink and, and, and have clothing. Right? And we don't. Notice he doesn't say anything about the second house or the second car or the, you know, the cell phone. He doesn't say anything about, about the livestock. He doesn't say anything about all of these other things that you can have if you're serving men. If you're, if you're working hard and, you, and, you, you know, and you're just providing for yourself. He's talking about our needs. And when it, when it boils down to it, our needs are very, is a very short list. We get so spoiled with our conveniences today. And we think, I need, I need a dishwasher. I need a washing machine. I need a dryer. I need a car. I need... No, you don't need. You don't need it. And people need to get this through. Look, in American culture today, get it through your heads. You don't need it. You want it. It may make your life easier. It may make you, you know, be able to accomplish more things in other areas. But you don't need it. What you need to survive is food and clothing. 
And that's what God says he'll promise you. I mean, think about it. Anything else is really just going to amount to a bunch of vanity. Things that you could have, sure, it's nice, you're going to have conveniences. And I'm not saying they're having those things as a sin. But how are you spending your time? What, what value do you have on, on what you do with your time? Are, are you spending it all just to uh, accumulate more stuff that's all going to be burned up in this world? Or are you going to seek God's righteousness and, and seek the kingdom of heaven first? God takes care of the birds. He takes care of the grass. He takes care of the flower. He does all this stuff and they're taken care of. Day to day to day to day. And it's been going on for thousands of years. God has taken care of them. So he's saying, if you have little faith, you think God won't take care of you? Verse number 31. Therefore take no thought, saying, what shall we eat? Or what shall we drink? Or wherewithal shall we be clothed? For after all these things do the Gentiles seek. For your heavenly Father knoweth that ye have need of all these things. It's not like God is ignorant of the fact that, God, I need to eat. Yeah, I know. I made you. Right? God created you that way. Of course he knows what you need. Verse 33, But seek ye first the kingdom of God and his righteousness, and all these things shall be added unto you. Take therefore no thought for the morrow, for the morrow shall take thought for the things of itself. Sufficient unto the day is the evil thereof. And verse 33 is where we get the condition. All the way up to verse 33, he's saying, look, God can take care of you. God takes care of the birds. God takes care of this. You think God's not capable of taking care of you. Of course God can take care of you. He knows what your needs are. These are your needs. You need to be clothed. You need to be fed. But I don't want you worried about that. I don't want you going out and spending all your time doing something else just in order to make sure that those needs are met. God will take care of your needs. But, or if, and this is where the condition is, seek ye first the kingdom of God. Seek first God. Seek what He has for you to do and, and, and His instructions for you and His righteousness and all these things shall be added unto you. Amen. You can't be seeking first the kingdom of God while laying on your couch at home. It's not how it works. Turn if you would to Psalm 37. The focus ought to be on serving God and what you can do for Him. The faith comes in just in the fact that God will take care of you if you do this. And the reason why you need faith for that is because you, you, you can't say, well, how am I going to make money? In it, right? I need money in order to support myself. I need money. But if I'm just going out and, like, say, preaching the gospel and doing all this other stuff, how, can I, you know, how am I going to do that? Well, God will. If you are just, like, I, I believe this 100%. If you just completely sell out in the sense of like go out and doing the ministry of the Lord just all the time, if you become like an Apostle Paul and you're just saying like I'm just going to go out, I'm just going to preach the gospel, and I'm just, you know, I guarantee you God will take care of you for doing that. I don't even think you need to have a job, a quote unquote job, you know, like I have a job, right? I'm a computer programmer. I get paid a wage because I do work for, for an employer. I don't think you need to do that if you just, if you did, if everything you did, and you need faith to do that. Now, we're going to get to this in a minute, but it's one thing for a single person to go off and just completely dedicate their life to serving the Lord and being taken care of, but absolutely. But there are responsibilities that come along with having a family and having other people to support also. And there is a time and place for earning money to support your family. And we're going to get to that. But first I want to focus in on Psalm 37. Look at verse number 3. Psalm 37, verse number 3. Trust in the Lord and do good. So shalt thou dwell in the land, and verily thou shalt be fed. Again, trust in the Lord and do good. There's an action there. There's a doing there. It's not just doing nothing and saying, well, I have faith God's going to do everything. Do good. So shalt thou dwell in the land. That's why you'll be able to dwell safely and you're going to be fed. Verse 4. Delight thyself also in the Lord and he shall give thee the desires of thine heart. Commit thy way unto the Lord. Trust also in him and he shall bring it to pass. Again, you're committing your way. It's your actions. It's what you're doing. 
Verse 6, And he shall bring forth thy righteousness as the light, and thy judgment as the noonday. Rest in the Lord, and wait patiently for him. Fret not thyself because of him who prospereth in his way, because of the man who bringeth wicked devices to pass. And then he, he, he transitions into you know the wicked person, and don't worry about all the things that they're doing, all the money they're accumulating, and all the wealth that they get. And don't worry about that. Don't, don't concern yourself with his business. It has nothing to do with you. Don't, don't worry about, about you know, the, his wicked devices that he's trying to bring to pass. God will take care of him. You just focus on doing what God has for you to do. Jump down to verse number 16. A little that a righteous man hath is better than the riches of many wicked. Say, if you're going to do righteously. Now, and look, and we have to understand this though too. Understand what the Bible is teaching here. This isn't some prosperity gospel that if you're just doing what's right and living for the Lord, you know, you're going to be rolling up in your Mercedes Benz and living in your million dollar mansion like these pimps that they put on the TV now. They have these shows on, on these preachers, that are these prosperity preachers saying that, oh, God's going to, you know, you give him one dollar, he's going to give you ten. You put a hundred dollars in that plate, he's going to give you a thousand. And it's still you know, telling you just to give all your money to them so they get rich. Again, the people say, the Lord told me this, right? And they're speaking lies out of their own wicked hearts. A little that a righteous man has. See, when you do righteous, God's not promising you to have all the riches in this world. That's not it at all, because it's not about that at all. What he's promising you is he's going to feed you and clothe you. So I'll take care of you. I'll make sure that you're fed and clothed. That's not much in this world. But what you're also doing if you do that is you're laying up treasures in your 401k account that's in heaven. The, the, you know, the, the plan that, that you're working for right now that, that moth and rust doesn't corrupt. It's not going to be burned up. It's not going to be broken down. No, no thief can come in and steal it from you. Like a thief can steal your car, can steal your, you know, your, your finances, you can steal all kinds of things. You can steal your identity, right? In this world, this day and age, run up a bunch of credit. Not going to happen with the rewards you earn in heaven. A little that a righteous man hath is better than the riches of many wicked. For the arms of the wicked shall be broken, but the Lord upholdeth the righteous. The Lord knoweth the days of the upright, and their inheritance shall be forever. They shall not be ashamed in the evil time, and in the days of famine they shall be satisfied. Again, the, the upright, people who are doing God's work, their inheritance is forever. You're not going to lose any of that. They're not going to be ashamed in the evil time when the wickedness is going on. It says in the days of famine, they'll be satisfied. So when the famine comes through the land and you're doing righteously, guess what? God will take care of you even then. Even in those times where you think, how in the world God take care of me? There's a famine. Nobody has food. God's people have food. People doing God's will. will. And, and you see that throughout, throughout the Bible. We see Elisha being fed during that three and a half year drought. Or Elijah being fed. And, you know, the, the, God had the ravens bringing him food. And he had a little water supply. And when the water supply dried up, guess what? God transported him somewhere else to take care of him. We don't have to worry about how is God going to do it. He promised to do it. If you have faith, if God, God promised you eternal life, I put your faith in your son, you believe that, right? Well, why wouldn't you believe that God could take care of you as far as feeding you and clothing you? Of course he can. Right. There's no reason not to. Of course. But. It's to those that are doing. It's to those who are upright. It's those who are putting God first in what they do. Not just in what they think or believe. It's in their actions. <clears throat> Verse 21. The wicked borroweth and payeth not again. But the righteous showeth, showeth mercy and giveth. For such as be blessed of him shall inherit the earth, and they that be cursed of him shall be cut off. The steps of a good man are ordered by the Lord, and he delighteth in his way. Though he fall, he shall not be utterly cast down, for the Lord upholdeth him with his hand. Look at verse 25. I have been young, and now I'm old. Yet have I not seen the righteous forsaken, nor his seed begging bread. Another important verse to remember that. That... that you know, in David's life, in the psalmist's life here in Psalm 37, you know, I've been young and now I'm old. I've lived an entire life. He says, I have yet to see the righteous forsaken or his seed begging bread. 
God will take care of us. He promises to do so. But again, we've got to be righteous. Verse 26, He is ever merciful and lendeth, and His seed is blessed. Depart from evil and do good, and dwell forevermore. For the Lord loveth judgment and forsaketh not His saints. They are preserved forever, but the seed of the wicked shall be cut off. The righteous shall inherit the land and dwell therein forever. Both of the passages we just read in Matthew 6 and Psalm 37 refer to having faith in God and that He will provide for us. Now, there are people that exist that are in need of alms, that are in need of charity, that are in need of of an extra means to provide for them because they are not able to work for themselves. Okay, so the title of my sermon was Faith versus Freeloading. Right? And I want to make sure I just bring this up because the group of people that, you know, I don't want to make it lump them in with a freeloader when they're not capable of doing things physically because they're handicapped, right? They're not just a freeloader. They're actually someone that needs help, right? It's not someone who's completely capable of working but just chooses not to because they're lazy, because they're a sluggard, because they just don't want to do it, because it's work, right? The guy doesn't want to do work because it's work. Well, guess what? We all got to go to work Amen. and do something. There's some work to be done. We went out sewing this afternoon. Guess what? That was work. We walked up and down a whole bunch of uh, hilly areas and driveways and talking to people and, and you know preaching. And, and it's work. There's work involved. And anything you're going to do, whether you're serving God or whether you're serving mammon, there's work involved. People that need alms, so a good example, you don't have to turn there if you want to, Acts chapter 3, the uh, Bible reads in verse 2, And a certain man, lame from his mother's womb, was carried, whom they laid daily at the gate of the temple, which is called Beautiful, to ask alms of them that entered into the temple, who, seeing Peter and John about to go into the temple, asked an alms. So here's someone, the, the Bible says he was lame from his mother's womb. Lame means he, he's, he's disabled. Right? He has some problem, and people had to carry him, right? So he's probably he's not able to walk on his own, of his own power. I mean, he can't walk, especially at these times. I mean, it's not like he's going to have a computer job sitting at a desk back in the times of Jesus, right? Not much for him to do. So what they would do is, you know, other people would help him out and carry him to this gate where people would come and go, and he'd be able to ask alms and just ask people, hey, help me out. You know, I, I, I can't work. There's nothing wrong with people like that, you know, receiving money for, for not being able to work because they're physically not capable of it. <clears throat> it's not sinful, it's not wrong to be in a situation like that and need assistance. And that happens from time to time with believers where you might get yourself in a situation where, you know, through no fault of your own, you just, I mean, you're physically incapable of working. There's things going on. You can't do it. That's not a problem, but there's also a problem, though, when people get themselves into situations like that. So we got to remember, this guy was, was lame from his mother's womb. He had no choice in that. There's nothing that he did to cause to bring that on. There are things that we can do where we get ourselves into trouble, where we get ourselves into positions where now you can't work anymore, but it's all a result of you making all the bad choices. Right? It's a result of your laziness. It's a result of your not taking care of yourself, not keeping healthy, not doing, you know, not doing all these various things. Now, as a church, and I've, I've mentioned this before, but what the way that we determine how we're going to help people out and who we're going to give alms to, and the way that I do it even personally, not just as a church, is what direction are they going? Are they seeking first the kingdom of God and His righteousness? If they're doing that, now even if they've gotten themselves, because look, we reap what we sow. When you get yourself into in the trouble and you know, you've got you've you know kind of made your bed, you're gonna lay in it. But if someone just realizes, hey man, what I did was I screwed up. Because look, we all screw up. Sure. But when you can recognize that and say, Well, I'm where I'm at because of what I did to myself. I brought this on myself. I realized that I was wrong, but now I'm going to try to move forward and fix that. You know what? I have no problems helping that person out. No problems whatsoever. 
You're going to seek God first. You're going to be coming to church. You're going to be, you know, doing what's right. You're going to, you know, getting in the Word, do it, doing what it is that God has laid out for you to do. Yeah, we'll help, we'll help get you out of that hole. We'll help dig you out. You've learned your lesson. You've repented. You know, I mean, that's, that's what it's going to take to receive the help of the people who don't want to seek the kingdom of God and His righteousness, but just want to collect money and, and say, well, we'll just take care of me. Sorry. You've got to seek God first before you can expect to be taken care of. And this is the mess. And see, this is why the, you know, the, the, the welfare system and stuff that the state provides is fundamentally flawed. If the government got out of this business of, of, of taking care of people no matter what, and people had to rely on church, guess what? They'd have to come to God if they wanted assistance. Instead of going to their God, the government. If you're relying, you know, because the church has a great design for helping people. God's ordained an institution to take care of widows, to take care of fatherless, to take care of, of people who need help. But it never comes as just, well, here's just free money. Right. That's never the way it works. Right. It's seek ye first the kingdom of God and his righteousness. Seek it. Doesn't mean you have to be perfect. It doesn't mean you just have to be sinless and, and you know all of a sudden super Christian overnight. No. Which way are you going? Are you seeking God? Are you making an effort? Are you coming to church? Are you are you trying your best? Look, and if you had a spiritual spectrum where you've got Jesus Christ on one hand, right, and the devil on the other hand, we're all on different points on the spectrum. But I could have a lot more fellowship with someone, like let's say, you know, and this may not be the case, but let's just say like I'm pretty far along on this way and there's someone else way back here. But if we're both facing this way and we're going, but we both want to head towards where Jesus is, hey, I got a lot of fellowship with this guy. But let's say there's someone else that's even farther along than I am. But they're going this way. Right. I'm not going to want to be hanging out with this guy. I got no problem with this person who still has a bunch of you know sin that they, that's, that's kind of in their life they need to get rid of. They're going the right way. And when it comes to alms, um, when it comes to helping people out, you know this guy that starts going this way, it's not going to be surprising when they start getting themselves into some problems. Why? Because God's going to be punishing them and chastising them. The last thing I want to do then, when someone's getting rebuked by God because they don't want anything to do with them, is to say, here, I'll help you out. Here, I'll give you some money. I'll try to fight against what God's doing to you for your disobedience and, and get in the middle of that. I don't want anything to do with that. Amen. What if the person repents and says, oh, you know what? No, I'm going to see God. Okay, because that's the purpose, right? Then we'll help you out. Now, I'm not going to, and it's not like I always know why things happen to people's life, but it doesn't matter. Because what matters is where the person headed. What are they doing? I can tell that enough by talking to people. It's not that difficult to, to figure out. See, the people that, that can't take care of themselves, they're not the freeloader. But there's a big problem when a person is capable of working and just becomes a freeloader. If you've got the ability to do it and you're not, you don't have some disability, you're not like, like incapable of working, then you need, to, you need to do the work. I mean, do the work for the Lord, for sure, first. Seek that first, before you even seek employment. And then, and then you know, pay for yourself or whatever through employment if needs be. But God's going to take care of you as far as your food and clothing goes. Now, the first two passages refer to what you are spending your time working on, not if you are working at all. Matthew 6 and Psalm 37, it's, it's doing God's righteousness. See, that, that, that's the what are we working towards, not are you even working at all. A person that is not working at all is a slugger. Again, unless you've got some disability or whatever. The Bible says in, in Proverbs 20, I'm going to turn to a couple of Proverbs. We went over this, so I'm not going to do too much time when we did the, our Bible study. Proverbs 20 verse 4, the sluggard will not plow by reason of the cold. Therefore shall he beg in harvest and have nothing. Now there's two applications of this verse, and this wasn't even something I was going to touch on tonight, but I think it's really interesting and timely for where we're at today. The sluggard will not plow by reason of the cold. Obviously, what the, the, the surface meaning is, you know, the lazy person, 
They're going to say, oh, it's too cold outside. I don't want to plow. Because when, when you're going to reap food, you're going to reap a harvest, that's work. There's a lot of work involved in farming, right? If you want to receive food to eat later, you got to put in the work now. And the sluggard says, that's nah, too cold outside. Well, yeah, when you don't plow, guess what? You can't reap. You don't put in the work first, there's no way you're going to get anything back from that. So he's going to end up begging and have nothing. We apply that to soul winning. There's a lot of work involved in soul winning. There's a lot of plowing involved. Right? If you say, oh, it's too cold. I mean, it's a cold day today. Right? I mean, we're supposed to get snow tonight. We've got a little bit of snow already. It's like, like in the 40s or whatever. I mean, it's not freezing, but still. To say, oh, well, it's too, it's too cold. I don't want to go out and plow. Well, yeah, you can say that, but guess what? You're not going to have anything. You're not going to have any rewards. You're not going to have anything you know, built up for you in heaven when you don't go out and do the plowing. It's not going to happen. You don't reap. You don't do the plowing. You don't do the reaping. Praise God for everyone that went out today. We had, we had one, one soul reaped as we went out and did a lot of plowing. <laughs> Proverbs chapter 6. Again, talking about the sluggard. Proverbs 6.6. 6, Go to the ant, thou sluggard. Consider her ways and be wise. Which, having no guide, overseer, or ruler, provideth her meat in the summer, and gathereth her food in the harvest. How long wilt thou sleep, O sluggard? When wilt thou arise out of thy sleep? Yet a little sleep, a little slumber, a little folding of the hands asleep. So shall thy poverty come as one that traveleth in thy want as an armed man. Being a sluggard, being lazy, is going to bring you to poverty. He's saying we, what we ought to be like if you're not like the sluggard, is going to be like someone who doesn't need an overseer or a ruler or a boss just always telling you what to do. That you are a hard worker to the point where you can do the work without someone telling you to do it. Just go out and do it. That's the, the, the attitude that we ought to have. That's a Christian attitude to have, is to be a hard worker. Proverbs 13, verse 4, The soul of the sluggard desireth and hath nothing, but the soul of the diligent shall be made fat. Now turn if you would to First Thessalonians chapter number three, or I'm excuse me, Second Thessalonians chapter number three. Second Thessalonians chapter number three. Because the Bible also puts a large emphasis on working to provide for yourself and for your family. I brought this up at the beginning of the sermon that. Yeah, if you if you are going to just dedicate your life to serving the Lord, He will take care of you as far as your food and, and, and clothing is going to go. Absolutely, amen. That's what the Bible teaches. That's what it says. There's no way that's not going to happen. When you have a family, there's a responsibility. There. I think still, if you dedicate your life to serving God, God will make sure that you are able to take care of your family and, and your needs. And truly, your needs. The problem is we have a lot of wants. <laughs> we want to satisfy but your needs, God will take care of that. But we need to make sure that we don't have this attitude and call it faith of, well, I don't need to work. I don't need to do anything because God will just take care of me somehow. God will take care of you when you're seeking for the kingdom of God, when you're doing something for Him. It doesn't just come on its own. I'm going to read for you from 1 Thessalonians chapter 2, verse 9. For you remember, brethren, our labor and travail for laboring night and day because we would not be chargeable unto any of you. We preached unto you the gospel of God. The Apostle Paul is saying, look, when me and Barnabas came, when me and my other helpers came, you know what we did? We labored and traveled. We worked and worked. This is what they mean. Labor and travel, right? We worked and then we worked. Night and and day. I mean, we were working all the time. Because we would not be chargeable unto any of you, we preached unto you the gospel of God. He didn't want to be like in debt to them. He wanted to owe them anything. He said, you know what? When we came unto you, and you're in 2 Thessalonians chapter 3, when, when we came unto you, we worked. We worked day and night. By day, we're preaching the gospel. We're doing all this stuff for God. And by night, we're doing other work so that we can support ourselves and that we didn't have to rely on you to take care of us. We're doing all of this work for your benefit. I'm taking nothing from you. Look at 2 Thessalonians chapter 3, verse 7. For yourselves know how ye ought to follow us. 
This is scripture saying, look, you need to be following our example. For we behave not ourselves disorderly among you. Verse 8, neither did we eat any man's bread for naught. So we didn't just eat people's bread for nothing. But wrought with labor and travail night and day that we might not be chargeable to any of you. Again, he's reiterating this in his second epistle to the Thessalonians. We worked. We worked hard. We didn't come in and eat your bread for nothing. We worked for it. Verse number 9. Not because we have not power. The position that they had as being ministers of the Lord, they had the power to receive food and be taken care of for the work that they're doing for the Lord. They had the power to do that. So he's saying it's not because we didn't have the power to do it that we refused it. He says, but to make ourselves an example unto you to follow us. He says, not that we, we couldn't do it. But we want you to see how much we're working. And we want you to do the same exact thing. What I think is that the church of Thessalonica, because all the churches have their own problems. Uh, Our church has its own problems. And I don't know exactly what they are, but I know I'm going to preach on it. (laughs) Lord willing. But what he's doing is, you know, the church of Corinth had a whole bunch of problems. We saw um, earlier this morning, um, Galatians, the church of Galatia had the problem about the, you know, the, the damnable heresies coming in and, and the salvation doctrine getting screwed up. That was a problem that they had and he was correcting with his epistle. And then I think in the Thess- Thessalonians, you can make it a case that they probably weren't working as hard as they ought to have been. They're probably getting a little bit lazy because we brought up in the first epistle and in the second epistle here in chapter number three, look, we labored and traveled day and night. We were being an example unto you. This can be done. And I praise God for, the, for the, the teaching and mentoring that I received watching somebody else do the work of a full-time job, full-time dad, and full-time pastor to let me realize, you know what, this can be done. Of course there's sacrifices involved. Of course there's all kinds of things that you have to do. And you know what, it's a lot of work. Right. I got home at like 2.30 in the morning this morning preparing for today. So like this is a regular occurrence that happens. You may not realize that, but there's a lot of work that goes involved in running the church, preparing sermons, and, and, and trying to take care of everybody in here when needs come up. And look, I'm not saying this because I want your sympathy. I'm not saying this because I'm trying to lift myself up. There's just a lot of work involved. And if you realize that, and you realize, hey, if Pastor Burzens can do this, maybe I can also work a full-time job and go out and do some soul winning. Maybe I can memorize the memory passages. Maybe I can do this other stuff. Because if he can do it, I can do it. There's nothing special about me being able... I don't have any more time in my day than you do. It's something that can be done. But we... we can't be lazy about it. We need to be working. Verse 9, not because we have that power, but to make ourselves an example unto you to follow us. Look at verse 10. For even when we were with you, this we commanded you, that if any would not work, neither should he eat. This is a biblical principle. It's saying, look, if you don't want to work, guess what? You're not going to eat. As soon as you get hungry enough, maybe then you'll start working. And again, we're not talking about the people who are incapable of working. These are the people who can work, but they're not working. Okay, well, if you're able to work and you're not doing it, then maybe you shouldn't be eating. Maybe that'll be the stimulus that you need to get up off your rear and do something. When you start getting really hungry, that is a powerful motivator, I'll tell you what. If you fasted for any length of time, you realize, you know, you get hungry. I want, I want this hunger to go away. And you'll do, you'll do what you need to do. Verse 11, for we hear that there are some which walk among you disorderly, working not at all, but are busybodies. This is a problem that was going on. There were some people, busybodies, get involved in everybody else's business and not doing their own work and just focusing on what they have to do. Always worry about everybody else. And apparently they had a lot of idle time in order to do this. And see, that's what happens when, you, when you're not keeping yourself busy with work, you're going to get into sin. You're going to end up doing things, get involved in things that you shouldn't be doing. Keep yourself busy. It's going to keep you from a lot of sin, keeping yourself active and busy. Verse number 12. Now them that are such, we command. Look at this. We command. It's not a suggestion. It's not, oh, this is what's best for you. We command and exhort by our Lord Jesus Christ that with quietness they work and eat their own bread. Stop getting involved in everyone else's business. Do your work and eat your own bread. And if any man obey not our word by this epistle, 
Note that man and have no company with him, that he may be ashamed. Amen. This is in context of people working and not working. He's saying, you know what? This is the commandment. This is the commandment of the Lord. This epistle that we're writing to you, if they're not going to obey this, point them out. Note that person and say, you know what? I'm not going to have any company with you. You're a slugger. You're lazy. You need to be working. Why? They ought to be ashamed. It ought to be a shame not to be doing the work for the Lord. Especially for the Lord. But just not working at all? You're not going to do any work at all? You're not going to work for the Lord and you're not going to work to, to provide for yourself? And you have no reason not to be doing either? You ought to be ashamed. But look at verse 15. Yet count him not as an enemy, but admonish him as a brother. The lazy person is not your enemy. Right? I mean, the, the believer, the brother in Christ, they're not your enemy. Now, they ought to be ashamed. They ought to be able to, to you know, again, use that just like the stimulus of, of being hungry in order to work so you could eat. The, the, the shaming is, the, is, hey, maybe I should do what's right now and, and you know, everything will be just fine. But we don't want to condone or, or admi- you know, um, we don't want to condone or, or um, perpetuate the problem with people by pretending like it's not a problem and continuing to take care of people that are fully capable of working on their own and they're not seeking God and His righteousness. First Timothy chapter 5, last place we're going to look. Pretty strong words on, on, on not working, right? I mean, if you're not going to work, you say, neither should you eat. And if there's someone like that in the church and they're being busy by they got this time and, and they're not working and eating their own bread, then don't company with them. Don't hang out with them. First Timothy chapter 5, look at verse number 3. The Bible reads, honor widows that are widows indeed. Just defining here what a widow is that we should honor and take care of. The same way the Bible says, honor your father and mother. That we need to be taking care of our parents. Honor widows are widows indeed. Verse number four. But if any widow have children or nephews, let them learn first to show piety at home and to requite their parents, for that is good and acceptable before God. Now she that is a widow indeed and desolate, trusteth in God and continueth in supplications and prayers night and day. But she that liveth in pleasure is dead while she liveth. And these things give in charge that they may be blameless. Now, this is explaining how a widow ought to be taken care of by the church. God's plan for taking care of a widow. It's defining, first of all, who is a widow. A widow indeed. Well, if a widow has family members, they have children, they have you know, other people in their family... That's not the church's responsibility to take care of that widow. It's the family's obligation and duty to take care of that widow. Right? I mean, like, if if one of my parents died, right? Let's say my father died and my mother's a widow now. She's left alone. Well, her church that she attends should not be, and biblically they're not responsible for taking care of her. That falls on me and my brothers. And, you know, she's my mother, right? We're going to take care of her. That is not who the church is, is, is supposed to help. The obligation and responsibility falls on the family. But then we go on and say, okay, a widow indeed is someone, verse 5 says, is desolate. Right? They don't have anybody. They don't have any family. They don't have anyone to take care of them. They're all alone. That's someone who's a widow indeed. But not only do they have nobody, it says they trust in God and continue with supplications and prayers night and day. So what are they doing? They're seeking first the kingdom of God and His righteousness. That is what they're doing, and it's exemplified. And, you know, someone, especially someone who's older, maybe a widow, like it's talking about here, it's it's not setting the bar super high of like, I mean, just doing a lot of physical exerting, physically exerting work. It says here that they continue in supplications and prayers night and day. Anyone can do that. You could be even elderly and, and, and a widow and, and do supplications and prayers. But the point is you're, you're, you're headed this way. You're headed toward, I mean, you're seeking 
God and, and his righteousness. And that is what you're, you're worried about. It says, And that's why verse 6 says, But she that liveth in pleasure is dead while she liveth. Yeah. What does that mean, living in pleasure? It means they don't care about the things of God. All they care about is just pleasing themselves today. Or tonight. And what, what feels good? What should I spend my time doing? Well, I'm going to go play bingo. I'm going to go play shuffleboard. I'm going to go whatever, right? Just entertainment. The stuff that's just mindless and, and living in pleasure, right? That is not, again, a widow, even if they're desolate, that the church is responsible for taking care of. God says no. Seek first the kingdom of God and his righteousness, and all these things shall be added unto you. So they need to be seeking God. That is then who the church is, is liable to take care of. I mean, it couldn't be any more clear from Scripture, but look at verse number 8. This is the last verse. We're going to close with this. But if any provide not for his own, and especially for those of his own house, he hath denied the faith and is worse than an infidel. See, if you don't, if you don't take care of your family, like financially, when they need food, when they need clothing, when they need the things that they need, when they need help, and they're in your family, he says, you're worse than an infidel. You've denied the faith. That is our duty and obligation and responsibility to take care of our family. And that's why I said, you know, we know if we're, if we're headed the right way, God will take care of us. But when you've got a family and it's your obligation to take care of people, that's why we end up, you know, that's one of the reasons why I have a job and I'm working. Is, is because I don't want to be considered worse than an infidel. I want to make sure, for sure, that they're taken care of. Now, you can say, and maybe even fairly so, there's a little bit of a lack of faith on my end for not just completely, you know, working 100% for God. And maybe that's the case. I just don't want to, I'm just trying to make sure that I am able to take care of my family. And that's, and, you know, the, the way that I could do it is, and, and it's not just that. Because honestly, that's not the only reason. I, I do also want to be an example to show the work that can be done. Because most people have a full-time job and they're not just serving God and with, with everything every single day. You can have a job to provide for your house and your family and serve the Lord. But what you can't do is be serving money as in... I want to just make a whole bunch of money and accumulate a bunch of goods and be working for mammon, for the, 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 the treasures of this world. That's where you, you, I mean, you just can't do it because that, if that's what you're focused on, that's all. That's what you're going to do. I mean, you spend your time focused on earning a whole bunch of money, then that's all your time is going to be spent doing that. But if you realize, well, I need to eat food, and I, I need to eat, and I need to be clothed, and, and I know God's going to take care of me, but I know he also wants me to work and not be lazy. And, and if I want to reap and harvest, I need to, I need to be plowing in the winter. I need to be plowing when it's cold outside or whatever, when it's early in the morning. I need to just get up and work. And that is the way that, that we ought to be. We ought to, we ought to have that mindset of being able to work and not just be, have a freeloader mentality of, well, God will just take care of me and, and I don't have to do anything. That's a wicked attitude to have. Let's seek first the kingdom of God and his righteousness. So we don't have to spend our time just fretting and worrying about the things that God already promised he'll take care of us for. As far as I want to Dear Heavenly Father, Lord, we thank you so much for the promises that we have. Lord, I pray that you please help to increase all of our faith. That we would be able to uh, focus on what is most important, dear Lord. That we would be able to uh, not get so distracted with the things either the pleasures of this world or just on making a whole bunch of money, but that we could just focus on serving you and, and doing what's right and, and sowing and praying and, and reading our Bibles, dear Lord, and, and, and everything else that, that you require of us and, and want us to do, dear Lord. I pray that you would please help us to keep that at the forefront of our mind and make sure that we're making time for that first before everything else. And, um, we thank you for these great promises and for these words of wisdom, dear Lord. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. Amen.